Uh, so for today, uh, kind of what we're going to focus on um, is kind of the larger groups of insects. So when it comes to kind of insects, when we talk about insects in general, you know, we talk about beetles or butterflies um, or bees, and that's typically kind of to the order of those larger groups of insects. So that's basically what we're going to focus on today is how to identify um, these insects, at least down to order. So, you know, kind of, kind of get you in the general ballpark uh, of what type of insect you have. Um, and then you can kind of go further from there and try to figure out um, what exactly you may have. So these are just some examples here. Um, so, and kind of comparing to a human. So our Japanese beetles, that's going to be the order Coleoptera. Monarch butterflies, just all butterflies and moths are going to be Lepidoptera. Bees, as well as ants and wasps, those are going to be Hymenoptera. So again, that's kind of the, the, the big picture we're going to look at um, because there's just so many insects out there and we only have so much time. Um, can only go so far in, a, in an hour long, half hour long presentation. So to start off, start off with, uh, we need to be able to identify the different parts of an insect that we're going to use in order to try to identify them. Um, and this is also gonna help us determine if it's actually an insect uh, to begin with. So insects are going to have three body regions. We're going to have our head, our thorax, uh, and our abdomen. Uh, arthropods like spiders are only gonna have two body parts. Um, and some of the other things that we kind of get lumped together as quote unquote bugs um, as well. They're going to have six legs or three pairs of legs. So again, something like a spider is gonna have uh, eight legs. Centipedes, millipedes, they're gonna have dozens of legs uh, and so on. Insects are going to have up to two pairs of wings. Um, some groups only have one pair of wings. Um, some different types of insects have lost their wings um, altogether as adults or they're greatly reduced. But in general, uh, most, of them, most of them are going to have two pairs of wings or four wings in total. Uh, insects have two different types of eyes. So they are gonna have two compound eyes, typically on, on the side of the front of their head there. Um, there's, for most insects, those are gonna be uh, fairly large. But again, depending on the species, some may be smaller or absent. And they're gonna also have these simple eyes, typically on the top of their head. These are called uh, ocelli. And sometimes this can be important in identification how many they have, where they are on the head, the kind of the arrangement can be important. But a lot of times that's when you're getting kind of narrowed down a little bit more, uh, when you start getting into the family and, and genus and species and stuff like that, that may play a factor. Uh, they're also gonna have one pair of an antennae. Um, antenna would be the singular of that. Uh, so again, help you differentiate from some of the different um, things that get lumped in as bugs that aren't actually insects. Um, and then the mouth. Insects have a variety of different types of mouths that they can have. Uh, so that can help you, one, narrow down, differentiate between some insects that look similar by looking at the mouth. Do they have a chewing mouth or do they have a sucking mouth part? Uh, what have you. And also can help you determine um, kind of the lifestyle of that insect. How, how are they gonna be feeding um, as well? Help you determine maybe if it's a pest or not, depending on, on the species you're looking at. So those are the things we're gonna look at when we're, we're identifying insects. So we'll go into a little more detail on each of these. So here are the legs. You can see there's a wide variety of different types of legs. Insects can have this as just um, a few examples of that. There's more out there. Um, but they're all gonna have these basic parts of the leg and you know, getting down to order, you're not gonna need to necessarily know these different parts, but the further down you go, you may need to know um, what these different parts are labeled because uh, you'll get into you know the cox is this size or stuff like that. Um, one important part for the for insects though, there's the femur. Sometimes that there's gonna be yellow on these pictures. That can be kind of enlarged. So you can see that on B um, for kind of like jumping legs. So again, looking at the legs, you can help determine kind of their their, their lifestyle as well. So A is a little more slender. That's gonna be more for a running type insect. B is gonna be for jumping. Uh, C, those are the front legs of a mole cricket. So something that's gonna be digging through the, the ground. Um, the one in the middle there, uh, E, that's for praying mantis. So you can see that grasping type hand, that arm. So again, help you determine how they live their lives as well. Um, and then tarsus, that blue area at the tip of the leg, those can also be important for identification. But again, that's typically when you're getting down lower um, into that family and, and genus and stuff, looking at those. 
Uh, wings and insects can also be uh, very diverse as well. So you can see here just some examples of the different types of wings insects can have. And looking at these, you know, kind of the general shape of them, um, how much veining they have, do they have scales on them? You can narrow down what type of insect it is as well. So on the top left there, that is a grasshopper wing. Those front wings tend to be kind of thin and the hind wings are more broad and fan shaped. Next to that, on the top, we have a lace wing. So they have lots of veins in their wings. Next to that is a bumblebee. So that's kind of a, what a typical bee wing would look like on the top right. That is a butterfly wing. So that's they're covered in scales. So if it's got scales on it, that's gonna be a butterfly or moth, something like that. And kind of so on bottom right there, uh, those are, that's a beetle. So those front wings have been modified into kind of a shell um, as well. And we'll talk about um, these different characteristics for some of these insects for their wings and how you can use those to identify as well. Antenna can also, again, can also be important. Uh, the type of antenna an insect has can help you narrow down. Um, sometimes it can help you to order, sometimes it help you to family. No, it just kind of depends on the type of insect. Um, but again, different insects are going to have different types of antennae and that can help you narrow down what you have. So just some examples here. Um, of those different types. So in the top middle there, uh, that is a fly antenna, that aristate. Uh, on the top right, uh, those moth uh, antenna right there, those plumose type. Um, on the bottom left and right, your more filiform, your longer antenna. The bottom middle, the elbowed antenna, uh, stuff like that. And again, using that to narrow down what type of insect you potentially have. Um, and then again, mouth parts. Uh, again, insects, typically we have these different parts of the mouth, and then over time, um, as they've evolved, they've kind of evolved these specialized mouth parts. So in the middle of their A, that's the chewing type mouth part. That's kind of the quote unquote original type mouth part. And then over time, insects have evolved different types of mouths. So whether that be D, that piercing sucking mouth part, B, um, that chewing lapping mouth part like you see in bees, um, C, um, with butterflies and stuff. So kind of in real pictures, what those look like. So again, that top left, that is a chewing mouth part. That is a tiger beetle. Uh, again, they're predators. So they're gonna be chewing their, their prey and stuff. Um, same with most leaf feeders as they're, they're chewing on the leaves as well. Top middle there, that's that honeybee. So you can see they still have those mandibles on the outside, uh, but they have that tongue sticking out that they'll use to, to drink nectar, lap up nectar and stuff. Uh, top right and the bottom left, we have examples of our piercing sucking mouth parts. So, these insects, in the case of mosquitoes, are, are sticking their mouth parts into, into animals and, and drinking the blood. Uh, the plant feeding types will stick those mouth parts into plants and draw out the plant juices. Uh, and then on the bottom right, we have our, um, our butterfly there. So again, that mouth part will coil up and they will extend that and stick that down into the flower to access nectar. So again, looking at the mouth parts can help you differentiate some of these insects that look similar that are part of different orders. Um, again, the eyes, uh, the, the placement of the eyes, how big they are, can help you determine what type of insects insect you have. So compound eyes, um, this is what they're using to see. So you can see on that picture, depending on how big this presentation is on your screen, um, you can see those little individual uh, facets or omatidia on there. They have a bunch of these little, these little facets that make up the larger eye. Um, help with vision and on the top, the simple eye, those are cell eye. Um, again, the placement and the number of them can help you may, may be needed to identify an insect. Um, for what we're talking about today, they're not gonna be important though. Um, one thing when you're identifying insects, it's important to kind of take into consideration the life cycles. So we have our complete and incomplete metamorphosis. With our complete metamorphosis, um, our larva, our immature stage, typically is going to look completely different than the adult stage. So here, a good example of that would be butterflies. So we have our egg, um, we have that larva. And in this picture, they actually drew a beetle um, larva. So just kind of ignore that, but that would be a caterpillar. A lot of times in complete metamorphosis, these this, this larval stage has a different kind of a specialized name. So caterpillars uh, for butterflies and moths, maggots um, for flies, grubs for beetles and so on but that looks completely different than the adults. So that can confuse um, identification. Basically need to know, be able to identify those two different life cycles because they look completely different. With the incomplete life cycle, those nymphs or those immature stages 
will look relatively similar to the adult. It's not a big stretch of the imagination that, you know, that little stink bug nymph is going to grow up into what the adult, the adult looks like. It may not look exactly like the coloring may be different, shape may be slightly different, but you can kind of see the resemblance there compared to the complete where they look completely different. So just something to keep in mind when it comes to IDing insects. So again, so here in pictures on the left there, uh, we have a black, black swallowtail butterfly. Um, so if you were to show this caterpillar to somebody who knew nothing about butterflies and, and caterpillars and stuff, you would have a hard time convincing them that that would turn into a butterfly. Um, they just look completely different. On the right there, we have squash bugs. And you can see those, those nymphs, those immatures, Coloring is different, the body shape's a little different, but it's not too far of a stretch of the imagination to see how that's gonna turn into um, that adult squash bug in that, in that inset picture there. So again, sometimes this can get confusing when you're, when, you're, when you're having to deal with that complete metamorphosis. So when it comes to insects in Illinois, we have about 17,000 species. So another reason why we're we're gonna kind of take the big picture here because there's no way we could ever go through all of those. 5,000 species of beetles, over 4,000 species of flies um, and so on and so forth. So for this presentation, I, again, I haven't, I'm not gonna talk about all the different orders we can find here in Illinois, uh, focusing on the ones you're, you're most commonly going to see or most likely to encounter. Um, stuff like um, Columbola, springtails, you may see those, but those are really small. A lot of times you're gonna need some magnification in order to be able to see those and ID them well. Um, silverfish, you know, stuff we don't typically see outside in the garden. Um, we've kind of going to skip over for this presentation anyway. So our first group are mayflies. Um, this is the order Ephemeroptera. So ephemera is short, ours for a day or short-lived. Terra is wing. So basically, this is getting at the adults are short-lived. They typically only live for a couple of days. They spend, you know, pretty much their entire life um, as immatures in, the, in water, they are aquatic. Um, so for all these, we'll start off with the line drawing and then show actual pictures of the insects um, as well. So this is what those adults look like. They have those two or three tails on the hind end there, um, which are cerci or sometimes called caudal filaments. Um, so that's pretty indicative. They have these really long tails, two or three of them. It's gonna be a mayfly. They also have these triangular wings um, you can see those front pair of wings, they are triangular in shape. So if you have these two things, more than likely it's, it's, you're gonna have a mayfly there. The adults, when they do emerge from, the, from um, whether it be ponds or um, streams or rivers or what have you, they tend to emerge in mass. You have these large swarms that all emerge at the same time. They'll mate, lay their eggs and then die within sometimes 24 hours or a couple of days. Uh, and again, these are aquatic, so these can be um, indicator species. Um, so, you know, if you have relatively healthy body of water, there's a good chance you may have some mayflies in there. Our next group are going to be our dragonflies and damselflies. So this is odonta. Uh, this is talking about odonta. Odonto is tooth. Uh, so this is talking about their mandibles. They kind of have little teeth on them and they're predatory. Uh, as well. Uh, so these are medium to large insects. They're going to have large eyes. And, and you can see these eyes take up almost the entire side of their face. So um, these are, again, these are predator. They have very good eyesight in order to catch their prey. And they have these small uh, bristle-like antenna, which is going to be different than something um, like our, our lace wings, which have kind of a similar body shape. They're going to be much smaller, but they have much longer antenna uh, as well. They're also going to have uh, two pairs of wings and they have this long uh, abdomen on them. You can kind of identify dragonflies and damselflies from each other as well. So dragonflies, that's that picture on the bottom there. The adults are, are much more stout or thick bodied uh, than for dragonflies compared to damselflies. Also when dragonflies are at rest, they keep their wings um, spread out like that at rest. Whereas damselflies, they're much more slender, more delicate looking. And when they are at rest, they will fold their wings up um, above their body, um, like in that picture on the top right. So that's how you can differentiate uh, the two of those from each other. Um, and both the adults and the larvae are gonna be predatory. Uh, again, the, the larvae or the nymphs um, are going to be um, aquatic. They're living in, in the water. Uh, 
are grasshoppers, crickets, katydids. So this is Orthoptera. Uh, so ortho is straight, terra is wings. And this is usually referring to the grasshopper uh, wings and like we showed um, in an earlier slide and we'll show again here. Uh, typically they have uh, large hind legs for jumping. So you can see this in these line drawings here. Again, they have those large uh, femur areas. Uh, they have a lot of muscle and stuff in there so they can jump. They also have, tend to have a large pronotum and this is kind of a shield um, type structure on the thorax. So you can see that in that picture here. Uh, the antenna are filiforms. So they have these long uh, slender antennae and these chewing mouth parts. You can see those mouth parts in the picture on the right there, kind of that reddish area. Uh, that is the mouth um, of this um, cone head uh, right here. And then as far as females go, they tend to have a, a long ovipositor. So the ovipositor is the structure they're going to be using to lay eggs. So the female males are not going to have this, but the females tend to have long uh, ovipositors, like you see there. They're going to be laying their eggs typically uh, in the soil. They'll stick that ovipositor into the soil uh, and lay their eggs. And again, they have um, incomplete metamorphosis. Um, so the, those those nymphs, those immatures, look similar to the adults. Um, that picture on the top left there with the blue background, that grasshopper, that is actually a nymph. Um, you can see those wing buds. Those wings aren't fully developed, so it's not an adult yet. So that's one way you can tell if it's a nymph or an adult is if those wings are fully uh, developed on that particular insect. Um, and here is, is what we're talking about for that, that kind of that narrow uh, uh, wing there on this grasshopper. So you can see that forewing is kind of uh, narrow strap-like, whereas that hind wing, especially in grasshoppers, is is more fan-shaped and tend to, tends to be a lot more colorful um, on those insects as well. Next group we have here are praying mantids or mantoidea. So mantis is Greek for soothsayer or prophet. So just kind of how they, looks like when they, their, for, or their, their front pair of legs, how they hold them again, looks like they're praying uh, sometimes. So here, again, we have that line drawing. Uh, again, they have these raptorial forelimbs. We talked about that earlier. Uh, these front legs, they have these spines on that they'll use to impale their prey um, when they catch when they catch it and hold on to it and then they'll start consuming it. Uh, they also have these uh, large triangular head with large compound eyes. So again, that picture on the top right there, see how that, that head is kind of a triangle shape in those large eyes. And you can see those little black dots um, on the eyes, mantids and, and some other types of insects. Uh, we'll have these, and these are called pseudopupils. So basically when you're looking head on um, at those eyes, those individual omatidia or facets are absorbing all that light so they appear black. So that's why when you move around, look at different angles at those eyes, it seems like those pupils are, are, are following you. Um, it's, it's kind of an optical illusion. They don't actually have pupils that are following you around. They're also going to have that elongated pronotum. So you can see that orange arrow there uh, pointing to that. Again, that long shield um, type structure uh, on that thorax and covering pretty much all that thorax um, on mantids. And you may see these in your garden. They will lay an ootheca. So this is basically, in, in the case of mantids, is this frothy um, egg case. Uh, the eggs are going to be inside of that. So that's something if you find in your garden um, as you're cleaning up in the spring, that's probably not something you want to bring inside. Because um, if there's eggs in there, and if you, depending on when the, when you bring it in, you're going to have little mantids running around all over the place. So just leave that out in your landscape and eventually they'll hatch and, um, and go around e eating stuff. And this particular picture, these are all um, Chinese mantids. Those tend to be the ones we see more often than anything else, at least I do. But we do have native species. Um, of praying mantids here in Illinois as well. And the Chinese are a lot bigger than our, our native mantids. Uh, next group are our, um, our cockroaches here. Uh, so you can see these have kind of an oval, um, somewhat flattened shape. So body shapes, that's good for getting into kind of small cracks and crevices, um, crawling under your doors and whatnot. They can squeeze into small areas um, because of their body shape. Um, they also have a large pronotum here and that you can see when you look down, um, straight down over the top, 
you can see it covers most um, of the thorax as well as the head. So that's pretty um, distinctive, at least when it comes to cockroaches, they having that pronotum cover the head. Um, they will also produce an ootheca like mantids, uh, except theirs is not that frothy mass. It's a little bit harder. Um, but again, you can see that the female laying that ootheca there kind of hardened. And again, the eggs are going to be um, inside of that. So these are the American roach, American cockroach. Um, one we commonly see outdoors, it may get inside, but they don't really survive all that well indoors. Uh, the ones we get inside are going to be German cockroach. Those are the ones on the bottom left there. They have those two dark bands <clears throat> on that pronotum, which is how you would identify those. And those ones we, we would find indoors and we typically would associate with um, you know, unclean um, areas. So next group we have are going to be our termites. Um, so commonly when people get termites, we typically will see the winged, the reproductive type. Um, and those are commonly confused uh, with ants. So the reproductives are going to be uh, dark colored, kind of black. And they have these uh, four wings that are about the same length, about the same size as well, which is one way you differentiate them from ants. The workers uh, are going to be wingless, kind of a dirty white kind of cream color here. So on the bottom left there, that is a soldier. So these tend to have larger heads because um, they have much more powerful jaws. They're kind of in charge of protecting uh, the nest. And then on the right there, those are the workers. Um, again, their, their heads aren't quite as well developed in jaws and stuff. They're gonna be feeding on uh, dead wood and other plant material. Uh, the types we have in Illinois, they are subterranean termites. So they're living underground um, in the soil. If you see mud tubes or something like that in your house, um, they will build those to get a, to get into other areas. Um, they build those so they're protected from, from the light and to keep that the humidity, that moist environment around them as well. So when it comes to determining if it's a termite or an ant, so again, termites are gonna have those equal sized wings about the same length, same width. Uh, they're gonna have a broad waist and they're gonna have straight antenna. So that's the picture on the top there. Ants on the other hand, um, their wings are gonna be different sizes. The forewing and the hind wing are different sizes. They are gonna have a constricted waist and their antenna are gonna be different. They're gonna be elbowed. So looking at those three different things can help you differentiate between um, a termite and an ant if you see those flying around uh, in your yard or, or in your house or something like that. If you have flying ants in your house, it's a good chance you've got carpenter ants, which it really isn't something you want um, in your home either. And the picture on the right there, you can see some of those mud tubes um, that you may see. If you see those indoors, either you, you have termites or you've had termites in the past, um, and they've built those to, to access different parts uh, of your home. Next group we have here are our earwigs. Um, so again, these are these are one of those insects. For me, it seems like people kind of think they're they're gross, disgusting, have a fear of them um, for whatever reason. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, so this is what they have: these kind of long, flattened bodies, and they tend to be reddish brown in color. Um, but they will have these enlarged, uh, kind of forcep-like cirrhosis, or these pinchers. As a kid, we called them pincher bugs. Uh, again, there's pretty much the only insects that have this. So if you see something like this, you're going to have um, an earwig here. Again, most people, you know, you get them inside your house, they would consider them a pest, but kind of outdoors, typically they're feeding on um, rotting vegetation, organic matter. Um, they're kind of under bark, kind of out of the way areas. Some of them can also be predatory as well. You may occasionally see them feeding on kind of our plants or more desirable plants, but that's that's not all that common um, for that to happen. So wouldn't necessarily throw these into the, the pest category. Uh, our next group here, we've got our hemiptera. Uh, so with these insects, their mouth parts um, are like a long beak. And that's that picture on the left there with that arrow pointing to it. Um, either they'll use this to attack other, other insects or feed on plants. Um, Traditionally, it's been, they've 
this group has been lumped with another group. So traditionally it used to be Homoptera and Hermiptera as two separate orders. Um, but more recently, probably within the last 15, 20 years, these two groups have been lumped together. Um, so that's how we're going to do it today. It was them lumped together. Um, but if you're, you know, you're doing some internet searches, you may find that these two groups um, separated. So it's Hemiptera, Homoptera. Right now, everything is in Hemiptera. What used to be Hemiptera is now Heteroptera. So kind of confusing, but just kind of know they've all been lumped together. Um, and that's kind of the way entomologists are looking at them nowadays. <clears throat> So that first group, that heteropterus, again, these are the true bugs. So technically, these are the only insects you should be calling bugs um, if you want to be technical about it. Uh, so for these, their mouth parts are going to be arising from the front of the head. So again, you can see that in the picture on the top right there. That beak starts at the top of the head uh, and then comes down. They also have scent glands. So we think about stink bugs. Uh, most of these insects are going to have some kind of scent glands. So if you've ever handled these, you know why they get the name stink bug. They don't smell very good. Uh, and again, this is going to be kind of difficult to see without a magnifying glass or something like that, um, but could, you can see that arrow pointing to that gland and then a little bit closer up there, typically on the underside uh, of those insects. Probably a little easier way to identify these um, is looking at the wing. So the top of the wing, of the forewing of that front pair of wings is going to be thickened. So the part closest to the body is going to be kind of thickened or leathery, whereas the end of that wing uh, is going to be membranous or more how we typically think of as an insect wing. You can kind of see through it uh, and stuff. So looking at those wings, looking at the mouth parts, probably the easiest way to uh, identify these. And these can be either pests uh, or beneficial. So the top right there, that's that wheel bug. Uh, those are beneficial. Those will feed on other uh, insects. You can see its mouth part is kind of short and thick. Uh, with these, typically that they have short, thick mouth parts, those tend to be predators or if the mouth parts are a little bit longer and thinner, those tend to be plant feeding and we would consider those typically to be pests. Uh, so just a few other examples of, of some of these um, true bugs that we have here. So the bottom left are stink bugs. This is brown marmorated stink bug and we would consider that to be a pest. And then next to that is a bed bug. Um, so this would be more of a predatory species, but again, this would be, a, a, this would be considered a pest. So. Just a few examples of the, the thousands of different species that are out there. And that red one um, is a uh, box elder bug. Um, our cicadas and hoppers, you may have been hearing about um, cicadas quite a bit um, with the um, brood 10 periodical cicadas coming out. Uh, here in Illinois, really only the eastern part of the state, um, a few counties in the Champaign area are really going to be the only place we're going to find this particular brood of cicadas here in, in 2021. We'll have a few more years before most of the state's going to be having a, a brood come out. Uh, but when it comes to these insects, uh, the mouth parts are coming from the back of the head. Um, so not, not the front like the heteroptera, but more from the back of the head. Um, and you're going to have to, depending on your how you feel about insects, you're going to have to touch them and hold them and be able to see that. So that may be something you may or may not be able to see that. Uh, the tarsi are three segmented. Again, this is going to be kind of difficult to see unless you're using a magnifying glass or something like that. Um, but they do have these short bristle-like antenna compared to the, the heteroptera, the true bugs, which have much longer antenna. Uh, just a few other examples of these besides cicadas. Um, so on the left there, that's red-banded leafhopper. Um, so again, one way I would say commonly see, but it's not uncommon to see it. Uh, in the middle, just another type of leaf hopper there. Um, and on the bottom right is a tree hopper. Again, all of these are going to be feeding on plants. So, you know, having one or two is no big deal, but if you get a lot of them, you would consider a pest. But typically, um, these don't necessarily get up to pest levels uh, on most plants. Potato leaf hopper would be kind of be the big, big one that causes issues, but that's more because of a, the saliva. It's saliva can be kind of toxic to plants. Uh, our next group are aphids, whiteflies, and, and scales. Uh, so again, this first one may, be, may not be seeing this, but the mouth parts look like they, they come out from between the, the front pair of legs. Uh, so you can see that there again, easier, easier to see, not all that easy to see depending on the kind of equipment you have. Uh, one or two segment tarsi, again, probably not gonna be able to see that all that well. But they do have uh, these long antenna, 
um, when when they do have antennas, some of these insects have, will lose these as they go through their life um, as well. So here, this is an aphid. Uh, aphids tend to be kind of pear-shaped insects. They can be green, they can be yellow, um, like these oleander aphids here. Um, they will have uh, spiracles at the end. Um, or not spiracles. Uh, they will have little projections um, at the end of their um, on those oleander aphids, those are kind of those black tubes coming off um, over there. That's kind of distinctive uh, to aphids as well. And again, these are all going to be, these. all these insects would be considered pests as well. They're feeding on plant material. Here we've got white flies against small insects. They have white wings, less their name. Um, see these a lot on, on stuff, at least in vegetables, on tomatoes and cucurbits, uh, stuff like that. When you disturb those plants, they may fly off and if you have a nice healthy population, it may look like it's snowing um, on there. We also have mealybugs. Um, so these are kind of a little more specialized looking. Um, they don't really have those long antenna anymore. See these a lot on house plants, um, especially if you have them outside and then you bring them indoors. Um, tend to see them a lot on those. And then we have our scale insects. So scales are, are very kind of specialized, especially as adults. So basically they'll hatch, um, those nymphs will crawl around, they'll find somewhere to, to feed, they'll hunker down, they'll lose their legs, they'll lose their antenna, and they'll spend the rest of their life in that one spot. This particular one, this is oyster shell scale. Um, they, they produce this kind of waxy covering over them that will protect them so you can't really spray for them all that well. You have to use a systemic insecticide if you're going to use that. Um, typically when you're managing these, you're going to try to manage them when the crawlers are out because uh, they're not going to be protected by that, that waxy coating um, on them. And, and scales like this oyster shell scale, these can be kind of hard to see sometimes. Um, they may blend in uh, with the plants fairly well. And you can get these on any kinds of plants. See them on woody plants, see them on house plants, um, herbaceous plants, you, know, you name it, scales can attack it. Uh, our next group are going to be our hymenoptera, or, and this is going to be our ants, our wasp, our bees, our sawflies. So, kind of a, a large group here. Uh, these are going to have four, again, four membranous wings. So, here um, you can see two of those wings the front wing and the hind wing. Um, and many of these will have um, these little hooks on the wings. So, those hind wings and those four wings will hook together when they're flying. So, it looks like they're flying. Uh, with one large wing because they'll, they'll hook those wings together. Again, that's going to be something you're going to need a, a magnifying glass or some kind of microscope in order to see. They tend to have a narrow waist. Uh, most of these are, are ants or bees and our wasps, particularly ants and wasp, um, to a lesser extent bees. Uh, again, you can see that, that constriction, that narrow waist um, with, this, um, with this hornet here. Uh, the females also tend to have a well-developed ovipositor. So again, ovipositors are used for laying eggs. So only females are going to have this and it has been modified into a sting or the stinger. Um, so only female bees, wasp, ants are capable of stinging. Males cannot because they do not lay eggs. So they don't have um, a stinger there. Uh, so we'll talk about some of these different groups uh, that, that kind of make up the hymenopter. So our ants. Um, ants, you can see here, they have these elbowed or geniculate um, antenna there. That's one way you can identify them. They also have a node kind of in between that, that thorax um, and the, the larger abdomen segment. So it's that kind of that reddish um, segment on that line drawing there. Um, and you can see a uh, picture on the right on that carpenter ant. Um, again, kind of that little, little triangular bump in between that thorax and the abdomen. So if you see a node on an insect, um, that is going to be uh, an ant. So right there on that triangle, that's or that arrow, that's that node on this particular ant. And ants can have one or two nodes. So again, when you're getting down to further down identifying ants, that, that's going to be important. Uh, here are some examples of some of the different wasp that we, we have here in Illinois. So on the top left there, that's bald-faced hornet. It's not actually a a hornet, it's type of yellow jacket. Uh, on the bottom left there, uh, Eastern yellow jacket, and in the middle, um, one of the um, um, paper wasp there. Uh, yeah, so these are, as larvae, they are going to be 
um, uh, predators. So the adults are going out, they're capturing other insects, they're capturing spiders. They'll bring those back to the nest, chew those up and feed those uh, to the larvae. So these are gonna be doing a lot of good uh, pest control for us. The adults can also act as pollinators. So despite the bad name that they get, these are actually very beneficial uh, to us in our, in our environments and in our, in our gardens and stuff. On the right there, uh, we have some other wasps that you know, people, we don't typically think of wasps like this. So the top picture there, um, those are some ichneumonid wasp. You can see that uh, big long black ovipositor going into that, that tree there. Um, some of these are gonna be um, kind of parasitoids of other insects. So they'll drill in there and lay their eggs on other insects. Um, and then they will eat those inside those, those uh, plant material. On the bottom there, we have a small parasitoid wasp. This is laying its egg inside of an aphid. So again, this is not an, what we typically think of as a wasp. This is just a little bit larger than an aphid. So, you know, you see this flying around, you may think it's a gnat or something like that. This is not, you know, something that's gonna be, be stinging you or anything like that. But lay the, a lot of these will lay their eggs inside of, of insects, whether those be aphids, caterpillars, um, what have you. Those eggs will hatch on the inside and they'll eat the inside um, of these insects and then emerge from that. So these, again, are good for um, on pest control. They do a lot of pest control that we don't see um, in our gardens. And then the adults will also feed on um, pollen and nectar. So they may do some pollination for us uh, as well. Uh, for bees, so kind of try to differentiate bees from ants and wasp here is that, uh, at least for the females anyway, they're gonna have some kind of pollen collecting um, apparatus on their body. So on the left there, uh, on these bees, you can see they've got these little uh, areas on their legs that they will pack pollen on. So the top picture, um, you can see, let me see if I can get my, so you can see right in here, um, they're packing that pollen onto their leg. Um, down here in this picture here, you can see they've got quite a bit of pollen packed onto their leg. Again, this is gonna be the females doing this. The males don't collect pollen. Um, some other types of bees, um, like our leaf cutter bees will actually pack that pollen on the underside of their abdomen. So if it's kind of in between a, a bee and a wasp, look for those pollen collecting areas. Bees also tend to be hairy. They're gonna be much more hairy than a wasp is gonna be. Wasp will have a few hairs here and there, but the bees are gonna be fuzzy. And again, that's gonna help them with um, collecting uh, pollen and uh, from plants and whatnot. So just some of the different types of bees that we have here in Illinois. So the top left there, that's gonna be our bumblebees. Uh, top middle, uh, carpenter bees. Uh, on the right, top right, that's um, a mason bee. Bottom left, uh, leaf cutter bees. So they'll go around and cut um, these kind of circular patterns out of leaves. They'll use that to line the, their nests with. So you may see something like this, but these, again, these are bees. They're not considered pests. Um, and losing a few leaves here and there from a, from a plant isn't really that big of a deal. Uh, in the middle, we've got a sweat bee. Uh, and then on the right, we have some of our long horned bees um, in there as well. So this is just a few examples of those. Um, I did do a, a Four Seasons a couple of years ago on native pollinators, um, where I go into a little more detail on, on some of the different types of bees we have here in Illinois, um, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, Sawflies are also in this, this Hymenoptera group as well. Um, and so that's the, the adult there on the, on the left. So this is the rose slug. If you have roses, you may have encountered these before. Uh, with sawflies, they do not have that constricted waist like uh, wasp and bees and stuff do. So that's one way you could differentiate those um, from them. They still kind of look wasp-like though. Um, with the, the larva, you can see they look very similar to caterpillars. Um, some of the different ways you can differentiate if it's a, a, a sawfly larva or a caterpillar um, is look at the eyes. You can see here sawflies have well um, developed eyes on them, whereas caterpillars are kind of quote unquote microscopic. They're much smaller, much more difficult to see. And then if you look at the um, prolegs, um, soft flies have um, six or more pairs of prolegs, so you can spell out soft fly. And prolegs are not true legs; they're just kind of fleshy growths from that from that insect that act as legs. Um, so you can see here they've got. Um, eight um, prolegs here, whereas caterpillars have five or fewer pair of prolegs. You may think, you know, why does it really matter uh, when it comes to pest control with, for caterpillar pests, if we're using something like a BTK, 
um, that Bacillus thuringiensis kerstakii, that is specific to caterpillars. You could put that on your rose bush all you want. It's not going to do anything uh, to manage these soft flies. So being able to identify that depending on, you know, if you're using pesticide, depending on the pesticide may or may not work, depending on the type of insect you have. And there's the eye right there. Um, so our next group are going to be our flies or our diptera. So diptera is die means two, tera means wings. These only have uh, two pairs of wings. The, the hind wings have been reduced to something called um, haltiers. So you can see that right here. And those are basically used for, for stabilizing flight. So if you find an insect that's only got two pairs of wings, more than likely it's going to be a flyer or somehow somebody tore their wings off or something like that. But they have these two large uh, front wings and, and reduced hind wings into haltiers. Um, it's going to be a fly. Uh, the larvae are also going to be um, legless, and a lot of times we'll call these um, maggots. So you can see them um, here uh, in this picture. Uh, when it comes to flies, we kind of have two different types uh, of flies here. So we have kind of our, our longhorned flies and our shorthorned flies, uh, two different groups uh, of flies here. So our longhorned flies, are going to be stuff like um, mosquitoes, um, black flies. Um, a lot of these are going to be feeding on on blood and stuff. Uh, if you're ever down in Florida during love bug season, um, love bugs would be another one. Um, so you can see here they have the they're going to have uh, those tend to have those piercing sucking mouth parts um, with a long antenna, and then our short horned antennas are going to, our short horned flies um, are going to be. Again, shorter antenna, this is going to be stuff like house flies, uh, fruit flies, um, hover flies, surfeit flies, that first picture of a fly. Um, and they tend to have uh, sponging or lapping mouth parts. So again, you can narrow down the flies a little bit more by looking at the type of mouth they have, as well as the type of antenna uh, those different insects have. Next, we've got our butterflies and moths, or Lepidoptera. So Lepido means scale, Terra is wings. So again, these insects, their wings, their bodies are gonna be covered in these scales. So if you've ever held a butterfly or a moth, um, you've noticed, you know, you'll get kind of this powdery stuff all over your fingers. Uh, those are the scales. That's what gives those insects uh, their coloring. So again, they have two pairs of wings. So four wings total. So you can see that here uh, on this monarch. Uh, and those are what those scales look like um, under a microscope. So again, this is what's giving those insects um, their color. Again, they have this curl proboscis or their mouth. Um, if they do um, actually feed, sometimes um, some, of, some of the giant silk moths do not feed necessarily as adults. They may not even have mouth parts. Um, and there are actually a few, few species that have chewing mouth parts, but again, vast majority have these curl proboscis. And then as they feed, um, they will unfurl those like those picture on the right. And again, they will stick this down into the flower and access um, the nectar from those flowers. A lot of times if flowers are visiting, that nectar may be down deep in the flower where really only butterflies or moths can access because they have these long mouth parts. Uh, you may notice with some of these butterflies, um, it may look like they only have uh, four legs or two pairs of legs. Uh, some of them, uh, especially the brush-footed butterflies, uh, the nymphality only have, their, their front pair of legs has been reduced. They're still there, but they don't really use them anymore. Um, they just have the, those, the middle and the hind legs um, that they use to, to walk around with. So other, other types of butterflies and moths will have all six of their legs well-developed and easy to see. Uh, again, the larvae uh, of these look very different. And again, we call them caterpillars. Uh, so again, these are going to have chewing mouth parts. Um, so they're, they're feeding on plant material. Again, you know, depending on what they're feeding on, you may consider them a pest. Uh, obviously, if you're you're trying to attract monarchs and you're growing milkweed, you wouldn't really consider milkweed or um, monarchs a pest on your cat on your monarchs a pest on your milkweed. But if you've got something like your own broccoli and you're getting some of the cabbage worms, you, know, you would consider those pests. They have three pairs of true legs, so that's that circle there. Um, so again, these are, are, are 
true legs are technically legs and they have these pro legs again those those fleshy growths that they use like legs and again they have up to five of them if they have more than that if an insect has more than that it's going to be a saw fly uh, not a caterpillar um, and this is a white line sphinx moth um, if you're curious as to what type this is Um, so one common question you get when it comes to butterflies and moths is how do you tell if it's a butterfly or a moth? So with butterflies, they tend to be day flying and they're going to have clubbed antenna. Um, so you can see that in the, in the pictures there with those arrows. Again, they have this, this narrow antenna that ends um, in a club or more of a, a ball at the end. Moths tend to be night flying. There are still several species that will fly during the day. Their antenna tend to be straight or plumose. And going further with, with the moths, the males tend to have those plumos antenna. Uh, so that moth picture on the left there, the, moth, the, the males have these much larger uh, feather-like antenna. They'll use that to pick up the pheromones from the females. Um, so they need kind of that larger surface area to pick up those pheromones. Whereas the females uh, tend to have uh, much more narrow um, straight antenna compared to the males. So that's one way you could tell between a male and a female moth. Uh, next group we've got our lace wings. So this is Neuroptera. Um, so neuro is nerve, Terra is wings. So you can see they have a lot of different um, um, veins in their wings. So this is lace wings, ant lions, owl flies, stuff like that. The stuff we're going to see most commonly probably going to be uh, lace wings, though at least in, in gardens and stuff. Um, again, these are soft bodied. Um, they have these. Uh, longer antenna. So you can see here, maybe you confuse this with a, like a, a dragonfly or a damselfly, um, but they do have longer antenna compared to um, those dragonflies and damselflies, which have much shorter uh, antenna. Um, and you can see here again, they have these four wings and they have uh, lots of veins on them. And when they are at rest, they hold them over their body like a roof. So again, another way you could differentiate these between um, dragonflies and damselflies besides the antenna and these being tend to be much smaller than those as well. Uh, the adults are gonna have uh, chewing mouth parts. And um, you can see that in the picture on the top there on that lace wing. Um, so they may feed on um, pollen and stuff like that a lot of times, maybe some honeydew and nectar as well. Uh, and a lot of times the larva picture on the bottom right there um, will have sickle shaped uh, mouth parts. So this one is a the larva of a lace wing, sometimes called a, an aphid lion. So these will go around and attack small, soft bodied insects like aphids, uh, scale, uh, maybe some small mealy bugs, stuff like that. They'll stick their mouth parts in there um, and then kind of suck the juices out of them. So these would be um, a predator, predator, you'd, predator you would want to have um, in your garden. Um, and I just threw this one in there because with identification, sometimes mimicry can be an issue. So right here, this is. Um, a mantid fly. So this is a type of, of neuroptera here. Uh, you can see those front legs um, are mimicking that of a praying mantis and the overall body color is mimicking a wasp. So it's kind of mimicking two different insects type here. Um, so it'd be easy to confuse this with a wasp or, or even maybe think of some type of, of praying mantis. Um, but if you were to look at, you know, those eyes aren't as, it doesn't have that triangle shaped uh, face like praying mantids do. Um, it doesn't have that real large pronotum. Um, when it comes to the wings, those wings are going to have a lot more veins in them than a wasp, um, the wasp wings would and stuff like that. So some of the different ways you could kind of narrow something down that way. Um, and then our last group here are going to be our beetles or our coleoptera. So coleo means sheath and terra means wings. Uh, so with our coleoptera, that front pair of wings has turned into kind of a hard shell. Um, uh, but first off, so again, these have chewing moth parts. Again, this is another tiger beetle here. You can see they have these, particularly for this insect, these are predators. So they have these large mandibles um, that they'll chew their prey up with. Uh, some groups like weevils have their mouth parts on the end of a long snout like this. So um, kind of like gonzo. Um, there. So again, these are, weevils are pretty distinctive. You know, if you have something with a long snout like this, uh, it's going to be a, uh, a weevil. 
Uh, when it comes, to, again, those front wings, those are hardened into an elytra, so they got that hard shell we typically think of with beetles. That's that front pair of wings that's been modified into that elytra. These are going to meet in a straight line down the back. Um, so that's how you would differentiate that from, from say, maybe one of the, the true bugs that may look kind of like a beetle. One, that true bug is going to have uh, piercing sucking mouth part, not chewing, uh, but their wings are going to overlap on the top, whereas beetles, those wings meet in a straight line uh, down the middle um, of the back or the, the back of the abdomen there. Again, th those front wings are for protection. Those hind wings are going to be, are going to be membranous. They're going to be used for flying, and those are going to be folded underneath uh, those front wings. So if you've ever watched um, a beetle land like a lady beetle or something like that, or get ready to fly, they'll lift up those front wings and they'll um, kind of unfold those hind wings before they take off uh, to fly. And same thing when they land, they'll fold up those wings and then cover up those elytra uh, over those wings to protect them. Um, when it comes to uh, the tarsi, they can have between two and five segments. So again, as you're getting further down into the beetles, when you start getting down, if you want to ID something down to family and you're keying it out, um, they'll have different tarsal formulas. So it could be something like a five, 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 so the front pair of legs are going to have five uh, segmented tarsi. The middle will have five. The hind will have a uh, hind pair of legs will have five tarsi. It could be a, a five, two, five. So counting those tarsal segments when you start getting down lower with the beetles uh, may be important if you're going to key stuff out. So, and it can be it can be difficult uh, to do that sometimes. When it comes to the the larva of beetles, a lot of times we're going to be calling these grubs. Uh, they're going to have well-developed um, heads with chewing mouth parts. Uh, so you can see that head is kind of a reddish color, uh, kind of that well-developed head capsule there. Again, they're going to have, uh, most of them are going to have uh, three pairs of legs uh, right here. You can see they don't, at least for, for the C-shaped grubs, they don't have any pro legs. That's how you can differentiate them from some of the different other types. Um, the spiracles are often visible, and spiracles are what insects um, use to breathe. These are basically openings that attached to a bunch of different tubes um, within the body that they move oxygen and stuff through. Um, but beetle, grub, beetle grubs, beetle larvae can have several different um, body forms. So this is um, grub-like C-shaped C-shaped grubs, you know, Japanese beetles, stuff like that, stuff we find in our, our turf a lot of times um, would be one example. Um, we have wire worms. Um, these are gonna be the larvae of click beetles. Um, Again, we find these in soil a lot too, kind of elongate, um, hard, hard bodied, uh, not like a, uh, a white grub, which is kind of soft. These are a little bit harder bodied. Um, we have um, some of these slender active crawlers, uh, like this, like rove beetles. Um, these are going to be active predators, um, again, in, in the soil, on the soil surface and stuff. Uh, we have some like weevils, which do not have any legs. Uh, so these are acorn weevils. So if you have acorns and you open them up, you find um, little grubs like this in there. They don't have any legs on them. More than likely, that's going to be an acorn weevil in there. Um, and then we have uh, stuff like this vermiform, um, which is kind of like a worm-like type. They do have small um, legs, though. And some of our some of our leaf feeding beetles, leaf beetles and stuff, will have larvae um, that look like this. So with that, that is all I've got for you um, today. Um, like I mentioned, we do have past recordings of, of some of our Four Seasons Gardening series. So there's other topics you're interested in. Uh, check out the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube page. Um, got a variety of different topics um, there. Um, and with that, we'll go to questions. Uh, we do have an evaluation for this presentation. so. If you have a smartphone, you can take a picture of this QR code um, and that will take you to that evaluation or you can go to go.illinois.edu slash what bug. Um, fill that out. Um, let us know what worked, what didn't work. What can we improve on? Other topics you'd like to hear 